Starting now, you can get a transcript of each week's Rich Dad radio show. Just visit www.richdad.com radio and download a copy today. This is the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. It's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Today's show is about the future. So let me ask this specific question because the future is kind of boring unless greed enters into it. So let's say I told you that gold was going to be 10,000 an ounce. And today, with royalties and all that, it's about 1400 per coin. And today, silver is about $17 an ounce. So if gold goes to 10000 an ounce and you could see it, what would you do? I mean, would you buy more stocks? Would you put it in the bank? You know, If you knew that gold was probably going to go up near 10 times, what would you do? And that's what the future is good for. Can you see the future. And so today I'm honored beyond belief, you know, like I've, I've had two major honors prior to this. Number one was being on the Oprah Winfrey show. You know, she promoted Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And number two was to write two books with our now president, Donald Trump. Now in some circles, that's a plus, in other circles, it's a minus. But today it's about the future. And we have, in my opinion, the greatest futurist of our time today. He's been, he's come in via phone or the, the web, whatever it is. But today I'm very honored to have James Rickards in studio with us today. And I, you know, Kim knows I'm just like a little kid running around the place excited, right oh, Kim? Oh, you're, you're a hero of Robert's, Jim. And he will, he's been walking around the house for months with his headset listen, listening to The Road to Ruin. I mean, he, he'll go to sleep listening to it. <laughs> He's a huge fan. And, and by the way, I did read the book, but the reason I, I read the book and then I listen to the audio is because, and I thank you for reading it personally, because you pick up a lot of information just from the tone of voice, the infl- inflections and things like this. So the road to ruin, I estimate I've listened to it 14 times on the headset, and it takes about two weeks to get through it, listening to it 14 times. You know what I mean? It's a lot of work. But every time I picked up something that I missed. And so for all of you who are listening is that one of the ways we learn is but via repetition. And one of the reasons Rich Dad Company was formed because we could see this crisis coming. You know, back in 1983, when I met Kim, I was I was studying a man named Dr. R. Buckminster Fuller, who was also a futurist. And Fuller was predicting the coming of this era we're in now. And we're in a crisis era right now. So it's very much of an honor to have James Rickards, the chief global strategist at Meriglim. He's also New York Times bestselling author and economist, which I think is funny because you're really an attorney. And he was with the, um, <laughs> I remember when, LTCM, long-term capital management, came down. And Kim and I were out in Thailand at that time, and the whole war was coming apart. But it was started by the Russian ruble and all this other collapse coming around us. I, I don't know how anybody can sleep at night. So anyway, I want to welcome to the program, and as an honor, I'm humbled, James Records. He's the author of The Road to Ruin, The Currency Wars, which is the first book I Red, The Death of Money, New Case for Gold, and The Road to Ruin. So welcome to the program, James. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Kim. Oh, it's welcome, gr- Jim. It's great to be with you. You know, I've, I've, Robert, we've met a few times in the past, and I've done the radio show with you and Kim in the past, you know, remotely. But to actually be here at your headquarters, be in oh. the studio, face-to-face, it is such a thrill, it's such an honor, and uh, also the opportunity to meet your staff and, and folks around here. We, what a great group of people. So uh, oh, congratulations you. on your success, and it's just a thrill oh, to be thank here. You. Oh, thank you, Jim. And the same goes for your daughter, Allie, because I remember in Road to Ruin, you talked about how you went to dinner with three powerful women, and Allie, named Allie, was one of them. And I said, God, I've got to meet her. So I met her this morning, and it's just really one big happy family. Well, she keeps uh, trains running on time. She's uh, brilliant. She's my uh, uh, wears a number of hats: my business manager, my social uh, digital media strategist, and, and a lot else besides. So I couldn't uh, make it through the day without her. Correct. And now, see, I would call I wouldn't call Jim Records a best-selling author and economist. I call him a futurist, and. He talks about the raven. Raven is the god of the future to, uh, uh, to Apollo, I think, something like that. 
But we, you called for 10,000 an ounce gold, and today it's around 1,400 per U.S. Uh, gold eagle. So it's not the price of gold. You see, I could sit up there and say, well, gold's gonna go to a million dollars. But you learn nothing. You, know, you just have to buy, you have to drink the Kool-Aid to go buy it for that. But the thing I loved about the road to ruin was the logic, the research, the analysts, the historical real life experiences that you went through to come to this number called 10,000 an ounce. So right now I'm gonna say it to you again, if you knew it was gonna hit 10,000 an ounce, and we're not saying it is, so don't go and do it just because of this. What I want you to listen to is how James Records came to the conclusion that today it should be $10,000 an ounce. So please, don't go out and buy it just because there's a number on it. And, and Jim, just in case people don't don't, don't know your background, oh, yeah, I mean, good. you've 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 consulted with the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. You've consulted with major all the major central banks. I mean, get a little bit of your background. Sure, and uh, and Robert's right. I uh, began my career as a lawyer. So, but before I went to law school, I got a graduate degree in international economics from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, the NHTSA School, which is ranked number one. So I had, I had a uh, deep immersion. And interesting, interesting thing about my class, I was there in 73, 74. I was the last class, my class was the last class that was taught gold as a monetary standard. Oh, Everyone says, you know, the gold standard ended in 1971 when Nixon suspended redemptions. That's it was a big deal, but that was it lingered on for a couple of years after that. Because what Nixon said, if you go back and look at that speech, and it's available on YouTube, he said, "I am temporarily suspending right. the conversion of dollars into gold." And there were five people up at Camp David that weekend, and I've actually spoken to two of them personally: uh, Kenneth Dam, who was um, uh, in the uh, White House, uh, Nixon White House at the time, and Paul Volcker, who was the um, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury. And they both said to me, they said, we thought it was temporary. They really did. They, they knew they had to devalue the dollar. They knew the system wasn't working. They would temporarily suspend redemptions, have another monetary conference, sort of like Bretton Woods, devalue the dollar, and go back to the gold standard at this new value, which was uh, about $42 an ounce. But the plan never came off. While they were negotiating and doing that, one by one, countries started going to floating exchange rates. Um, and then the cat was out of the bag. They couldn't stop it. And the French were the last holdout. They wanted to go back to gold, but we never did. So sure, 45 years ago, we're still not back on the gold standard. But they, they really did think it was temporary. But my point is, it took a few years for that to happen. So when I was in graduate school, the IMF was still treating gold as a monetary asset. We learned gold. And my professors, so I'd say I had a 50, 55-year-old professor in 1974. Well, these were the young guns of Bretton Woods. These were the oh, academics, the 25, 30-year-olds who were running Bretton Woods through the 50s and 60s. So yeah, I, for, for those of men know what Bretton Woods was, it was a conference in 1944 where the world got together. The U.S. dollar became the reserve currency of the world. In other words, the dollar was as good as gold as long as the U.S. You know, pledged to keep about 20% of its dollars in gold, something like that. that well, that's, uh, that's exactly right, Robert. So the, the Bretton was uh, named after a, a town in New Hampshire, right. uh, and it was the Mount Washington Inn, very remote location. Actually, uh, it was a friend of Franklin Roosevelt's who owned it, so he said, let's have the conference there so my friend can get some business, but it really is in the <laughs> middle of nowhere. Um, but uh, there, were, there were competing plans, but the U.S. plan was, we will lock the dollar to gold. So the dollar was, was going to be $35 an ounce for gold. That was fixed. All the other currencies were linked to the dollar. They were not linked to gold, they were linked to the dollar. Now, indirectly, you had a linkage to gold. But you could, if you were under distress, distress you could go to the IMF and get permission to devalue your currency against the dollar. The one thing that couldn't happen was the dollar could not devalue against gold. That was the anchor of the whole system. And that's what Nixon busted up um, in 1971. Although, as I said, it took a few years for that to play out. So we, I, I learned all this history. And then uh, I always uh, say, if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they literally stopped teaching it in the universities. There's no economics department today that teaches you anything about gold. So like I say, you have to sort of educate yourself if you want to know about it. But um, so that's a little bit of my background. Then I went to law school, uh, had a long career in banking. So um, uh, 10 years of Citibank, 10 years with a major investment bank. There was a what they call primary deal on government securities. That's when I really learned the government securities market, derivatives. Um, start to finish with the uh, hedge fund, long-term capital management. Um, I was, uh, like I said, I was the lawyer, not the risk manager, uh, but 
when when it all fell apart in 1998, and that scenario you described, Robert, which did begin in Thailand, began in Thailand in 1997, uh, 97, spread around the world. But the interesting thing about that, so it starts in June 97 uh, in Thailand, comes to a head in September 1998 in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is where we were located. We were hours away from closing every stock and bond exchange in the world. And people don't realize how close it came. That's no exaggeration. One hedge fund called LTCM. One hedge fund uh, called Long-Term Capital Management, right. LTCM, exactly. Um, and uh, But the thing is, it wasn't just the hedge fund. We had $1.3 trillion dollars worth of derivative contracts with Wall Street, with the, what I call the 14 families, all the major investment banks. So, so if, all the investment banks had some of your products. They were our counterparts. That's exactly yeah. right. That's called counterparty risk. Counterparty risk. That's, exactly. a, that's a very big word, counterparty risk, because when we go back to gold, gold doesn't have counterparty risk. Gold is just gold. It's not a, yeah. it's not a contract. No one has to perform. No one has to be good for it. No one has to pay off an IOU. It's just gold, and that is one of the attractions right. of it. So we were um, our firm was uh, was was melting because of this crisis. Uh, we were getting close to zero. But the point is, I said, look, if we file for bankruptcy, if long term capital management files for bankruptcy, and I was the lawyer, I said, I'll just sleep in the next day. I'll, I'll go get another job, right? But you, Wall Street, are going to have to deal with the $1.3 trillion of counterparty risk because the way it works is, so you're a bank, so you're, you're long, short, long, short, long, short, you're a buyer and a seller, and you're making money on the spread. So you've got, in the aggregate, as I say, over a trillion dollars of contracts with us. If you take us out of the equation, we file for bankruptcy, we go away. All of a sudden, <laughs> you no longer have a balanced position. You're on one side of the trade. What you thought was your hedge just disappeared. So now you have to go into the market to reconstitute that hedge. But that was the, that was what the, the government was worried about. That's a what hedge the, is kind of like an insurance policy. Correct. It, right. I have, I, have a, 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 I own something, but I'm worried it's going to go down, so I do something else to protect Correct. against that risk. That's, that's a hedge. That's exactly it's like you right. buy a piece of real estate, you buy insurance in case of real estate burns. Correct. Down. Title insurance, uh, homeowner's insurance, so et cetera. When when, so when long-term capital disappeared, they could no it's longer go to... They could no longer go to you to, to... We couldn't perform our side of the contract, which meant they had to go out and hedge. They thought they had a hedge position, take us out of the mix. All of a sudden, you're unhedged, and they would have to go out into the market and hedge. So nobody really cared. They didn't bail us out. They bailed themselves out. So by putting more money in and, and, and supporting the balance sheet, we could then go ahead and perform on all those contracts. But It's, but it's really a horrible story when I, when I read about it. Is the banks came in and screwed you guys again, even worse? Yeah, we were. Look, we uh, we lost. But by the way, most of that money was our money. There was uh, about four trillion of losses, but two point six trillion of that was our money. They put the uh, the four billion dollars in, so then the balance sheet was solid. We spent a year unwinding the trades, but unwinding it gradually is very different than unwinding it all at once. And when the Fed came up to Greenwich to visit our offices, uh, Peter Fisher, who is the, the head of, of market operations at the New York Fed, we went through the books. We were very transparent. We said, hey, we, you know, we, this is not about us. We didn't think we were going to get bailed out. In fact, we didn't. As I say, they bailed themselves out. But we went through position by position. And when we were done, it took hours. And Peter looked up at uh, me and uh, John Merriweather and said, you know, I knew you guys were going to take down the bond market. I didn't know you were going to take down the stock market, too. We had $15 billion worth of open stock positions. And again, there's not that much liquidity in the market. So that's what that was all about. But but my point being, I then I went on. I ran a stock exchange. I worked for the CIA for about 10 years doing what we call market intelligence or mark int. Uh, using financial analysis, we can we can talk about that. But so a bit of an eclectic career. But, but you, you've also worked for the Defense Department. Defense Department. Well, and that's where currency wars came from. Correct. And you know, Robert, I take when you describe me as a futurist, I take that as a very uh, very nice compliment oh, it because is. I um, I've actually met a number of futurists because you mentioned Buckminster Fuller, Alvin Toffler, uh, oh, but I, I met uh, I worked with the chief futurist at the Pentagon. His name was Andy Marshall. He's still alive, but, uh, but Andy served eight presidents. He was appointed by President Nixon in, uh, in the early 1970s uh, and worked all the way through um, the Obama administration. He retired about two years ago before Trump, but that was a total of eight presidents. When I met him, he was uh, 92 years old. Interesting, a 92-year-old futurist, but maybe yeah. the more you know yeah. about the past, the better yeah. you are at, at the future. But, you know, sharp as attack and his... Um, his job was not to look six months or one year or two years down the road. His job was to look five or ten years down the road, think about the future of warfare and what the Pentagon needed to do. So I was uh, meeting with him about financial risk. And I said, uh, 
uh, I said, Mr. Marshall, I said, you know, the, the time may come when a U.S. destroyer pulls up to a fuel dock in Singapore and you say, fill her up, and the operator says, fine, pay me in SDRs. Those SDRs are special drawing rights. This is world money. It's not complicated. It's like, it, a, like a one world dollar. currency. One world currency, that's exactly right. Not the U.S. dollar, and that's the key point. And I said, for the first time, you're going to have a very expensive forward-deployed military that you have to pay for in a currency that you don't print. So that's why we're here listening to James Rickard, again, the author of The Road to Ruin, Currency Wars, The Death of Money in the Case of Gull. And again, the question is, if you knew that gold was going to go to 10000 sometime in the future, and we're not saying it is, and today gold's at $1,400, what would you do? And that's the power of seeing the future. So when we come back, we'll be going on further with James Rickards to find out his logic for the calling of $10,000 an ounce gold. You're listening to The Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. Don't be like Charlie. Charlie is that do-it-yourselfer who does himself in. Do-it-yourself is good for tile and grout. It is not good for asset protection. Charlie thought he'd save a few dollars forming his LLC online. With no guidance, he did it wrong. When he sold the property, he lost thousands and thousands of dollars. He did himself in by trying to do it himself. Don't burn yourself. Use Corporate Direct to set up and maintain your LLCs and corporations. Corporate Direct is owned and operated by attorney and rich dad advisor, Garrett Sutton. Garrett wrote the bestsellers, Loopholes of Real Estate and Start Your Own Corporation. He is Robert Kiyosaki's attorney for asset protection. He and his team will do it right. Visit them at CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Rich Dad and receive $100 off your formation fee. That's CorporateDirect.com. CorporateDirect.com. Log on to RichDadRadio.com while you listen. Now back to Robert Kiyosaki. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. Good news and bad news about money. We have, in my opinion, the greatest futurist of our time sitting in the Rich Dad office. I started with this book, Currency Wars. I moved up to the death of money. A new case of gold and then the road to ruin. But anyway, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android. And you can go to richdadradio.com because all of our programs are archived. We archive them because repetition is how you learn and you learn best. So you can go to richdadradio.com, download this interview with James Ricketts, who was in Rich Dad Studio. Such an honor for me. And listen to it again and again. But most importantly, have your friends, family, and business associates listen to it. Because it is about the future. And the tease I put out there was if you knew an ounce of gold was going to go to 10000 an ounce, and today it's $1,400 an ounce, would you leave your money in the bank getting 1.2%? That's kind of the question we're asking. Any comments, Kim? I love the subtitle of The Road to Ruin, The Global Elite Secret Plan for the Next Financial Crisis. And at somewhere in this show, we have so much to talk about. I'd oh, love to it. know... You know, what can you as a listener do to prepare for this how coming many, financial crisis? How many times did I listen to Road to oh, Road? Oh, hundred probably. I don't know. <laughs> I was walking around. I looked like Mickey Mouse with his headsets on on Bluetooth listening to you. Because I can pick up from your inflection and your tone and, you know, the emphasis you put. So thank you for reading The Road to Ruin versus Let Somebody Else, which, which is what I do, read the book. So we're going back again. We're going to $10,000 an ounce goal. We're not going to give it the answer yet. But we're going into the logic of why you came to that conclusion. What do you see that's coming? Well, you put your finger on it, Robert, which is the logic and the analysis behind it. I, I don't like to debate claims because you can debate them all day long and not get anywhere. So I have a medium-term forecast of gold at $10,000 an ounce. My friend Harry Dent says $800 an ounce. Well, those are two claims. So you can yell 10800 all day long, but it's just two guys debating claims. That doesn't get you anywhere. What, what I say to Harry, and we have debated this, is, says, Harry, what's your analysis? How do you get there? And then ask me. In all fairness, Jim, what's your analysis? Then you can debate the analysis and the methodology, and you're much better informed. You can yeah. form your own opinion based on it that. Makes so a lot that's, of sense. That's what I like to do is kind of uh, look, look behind the numbers a little bit. But where where it starts, Robert, is um, look, they're all all different forms of money. So the dollar is money, the euro is money, 
Gold is money. Silver is money. And Bitcoin. Bitcoin is money. Uh, and at uh, various times and places in the past, feathers, shells, beads have all been money, digital money, credit cards, debit cards. These are all forms of money. And then people say, well, they're not backed by anything. You know, the dollar is not backed by anything or Bitcoin is not backed by anything or feathers or shells are not backed by anything. But they actually, they're all backed by one thing. And it's the same thing, which is confidence. Mm. If you have confidence yeah. that it's money, yep. then it's money. If I uh, give Kim, if I give you uh, you know some shells or something, and you're confident that you can give it to the next person, they'll Buy accept it in exchange it. for goods and services. Then it's money, which is kind of what's happening with Bitcoin right now. Uh, I mean, it, we're not going to go into that whole discussion, but yeah, people could, have, there's people that are very confident with it, and people that are not confident with right, it. Right, and that's the point. So, uh, so obviously, the more confidence, the better. So, if if a large group of people are confident that they can take money from me uh, in exchange for goods and services and turn it around and give it to the next person. Then it's money. I don't care what, what form it takes. The point is confidence is fragile. It's easily lost and almost impossible to regain. And so the question is, how confident are you in a certain form of money? And are there threats on the horizon that could destroy confidence? And then I always like to go a step further to what I call the reaction. Don't just forecast a, a, a bad thing. A let's say, yeah. what's 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 the response? What are people going to do in response to that? And just play it out uh, and see how it goes. Most people ask one or two questions, but they don't ask four or five questions, four or five questions and really go all the way down the line. So um, it's all about uh, confidence in the dollar. That's that's the main... May, may, may I give you my mantra? Please. Money is an idea backed by confidence representing work truly done and is exchangeable. Yeah. I, I run that in my head. That's it. That's the key a, word is confidence and it's exchangeable. If key you lose those two things, you're finished. Confidence. And confidence is just a a, a Latin form of trust. You know, con right. with fide, fide, faith. Also fiduciary. Yeah, confidence with faith, fiduciary. That, that's what that's what that's what makes money. And the dollar's in trouble. Is that, that's what you're the saying. The dollar's going to be in a lot worse. It's getting in worse trouble and it's going to get a lot worse. And from that here. affects gold. Correct. Now Go back 1977, Jimmy Carter's president, and very few people know this. In 1977, the United States Treasury issued bonds, treasury bonds, denominated in Swiss francs. That's how bad, that's how quickly confidence was collapsing in the dollar. Now, we turned it around, Paul Volcker, Ronald Reagan, higher interest rates, you know, there was a whole, we, we were crashing, you know, the, the plane was crashing, and, and Volcker and Reagan kind of grabbed the joystick and got it out of the dive and got it, it back, the king back up standard. in the gear again. The, then it became the king dollar standard in the right. 80s and 90s all the way through to um, to not not that long ago. But imagine the United States Treasury, people saying, I don't want dollars, I'll take treasury bonds, but you've got to put them in Swiss francs, not dollars. That happened, they were called Carter bonds. <laughs> uh, very, again, very uh, few people know that. So we've seen a, a close brush with a loss of confidence in the dollar in the late 70s, and, we're, and we're, we're seeing one again. And so the thesis behind gold is, okay, if people lose confidence in the dollar and you've got to restore confidence, you know, you're in this nosedive again. Who's the new Paul Volcker? Paul Volcker is still uh, alive and well. You know, I see him uh, occasionally in New York, but, uh, you know, he's not going to be the guy to save the world the next time. How are you going to restore confidence in the dollar? Um, and one way to do that is with gold. Uh, if you said, okay, well, now we're going to have a gold-backed dollar, even if it's not a hard gold standard, it's we're using gold as a reference. We're using we're putting gold back into our monetary policy considerations. That will restore confidence. Then you have to ask yourself the next question: Okay, what's the price? Because you know one of the criticisms of gold, people say, well, gold can never be a monetary it's a barbaric standard. relic of the past. Barbaric relic of the past, which, right. by the way, John, John Maynard Keynes never said. I, I understand. I, I, uh, so uh, I dug into that one. He also, said the gold standard. Correct. The standard was a gold. The he did not say gold was a barbarous relic. He said the gold standard of the time. And he was right about that. That was a mess. But um, so I read your book. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, and so. Uh, so the question is, uh, if you restore confidence, if you use gold to restore confidence, which I do see coming, you have to ask yourself at what price? Because um, if you get the price wrong, it can be highly deflationary. It can make things worse. And people say, well, we can't have a gold standard because there's not enough gold. You hear that all the time. You know, maybe it worked in the 19th century. Maybe it worked until 1971. But since then, the global economy has expanded drastically. We're into trillions of dollars. There's the gold hasn't. There's the supply hasn't gone up that much. So we don't have enough gold to support trade and commerce today. And I say nonsense. There's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. If you take the supply of gold, the official supply of gold at thirteen hundred dollars an ounce, which is about where it is now, uh, and that that has to support the money supply, yeah, that you'd have to shrink the money supply by eighty percent 
to make that work, and that would be deflationary and depressionary. But all you have to do is mark up the price to a higher level, and then with the same amount of gold at a higher price, you can support a larger money supply. And that's what Roosevelt did back in 1933. It's exactly what he did, Robert. And he did it for uh, a reason that the Fed is now wrestling with, which is how do you cause inflation? So 1929 to 1933 was the longest period of sustained deflation in American history. And Price deflation is depression. Deflation is depression. Deflation, actually, the best performing asset in deflation is cash because prices are dropping. And so if you have an amount of cash and prices are dropping, you get more for your money. So the, the person who holds cash is the king of the hill. The problem with that is everyone realizes it and they hold on to cash and don't spend it. If cash is going up in value because prices are dropping, people won't spend the cash. That's correct. And then what happens? Prices drop more. And that, the that means is, if, you, if you knew a Ferrari was not $200,000, this today, but it will be a hundred thousand. You would wait. wait you, you would wait for it to drop. You to wouldn't 100, buy. But if everyone's hoarding cash and not buying, what's happening right. to the economy? Prices are dropping more. This is this is what Keynes called the liquidity trap. You right. just, everybody wants cash, nobody wants to spend. So Roosevelt said, "How do I get people out of the liquidity trap?" And the answer was, "I can devalue the dollar, but against what? The sterling, French francs at the time, uh, you know, Japanese yen." Uh, no, because that was the currency where they were devaluing against each other. He said, I've got to do it against gold. Now, everyone says Roosevelt raised the price of gold, which he did, from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. He did do that. But the way I think about it, no, gold was just gold. An ounce of Correct. gold is an ounce of gold. What he did was he devalued the dollar by 75%. And nothing happens in isolation. And this is the big point that Jim is making. Gold is gold. Gold is gold. So if you price is going up and down, it has more to do with the dollar than the gold. Correct. When I see the price of gold go up, I say, well, the price of gold didn't do anything. What happened was the dollar went down. Right. It takes me more dollars to buy my ounce. The dollar has devalued. It all depends how if you think if you think the dollar is the standard of everything and you measure everything in dollars, then yes, gold goes up or down. But if you flip that and say, let me make gold the standard. Let me take an ounce of gold, and that's my yardstick. That's my measuring stick. Then what you realize is that changes in the dollar price of gold are really changes in the dollar, not in the value of and, gold. And this is another big point where, again, intelligence is if you agree with me or not, is Kim and I hold, own a lot of gold and silver coinage and stuff like that. We don't have ETF, no paper gold. Right. But we also don't see gold and silver as an investment. And why, you say the same thing. Why do you say that? I agree with that completely. Gold is money. And uh, you know, another one of the criticisms of gold is like, well, I don't want gold because it has you no catch hell for that. I know uh, exactly. They say, uh, I don't want, uh, I don't want gold because it has no yield. You know, uh, Warren Buffett's the king of. Uh, everyone thinks he's a great stock picker. He made a few good calls, but Warren Buffett is really the king of tax deferred compounding. He realized at a young age the the power of compounding. So Warren Buffett's all about yield, and that's fine, assuming that the things you're investing in don't uh, don't go to zero, which occasionally they do. But uh, so gold has no yield. That's true. But my point is, it's not supposed to have a yield. It's money. Money doesn't have a yield. Reach in your purse or wallet, pull out a twenty dollar bill, hold it in front of you, and say, "What's the yield?" Zero. Zero. There is no yield on a twenty dollar bill. And you say, "Oh well, I can get a, I can get a yield by putting it in the bank." Well, it's not money anymore. When you put it in the bank, that's not money. They call it money. The Fed wants you to think it's money. It's an unsecured liability of an occasionally insolvent. Financial institution. In other words, it's an IOU from the bank. Okay, you got to have to pay you something for the risk. Correct. That's the point. So anyway, that's, that's a big point. Say, there's no risk in gold by itself. If the if price I, may fluctuate. Right. If I have a hundred dollar bill, it's always going to be a hundred dollar bill. Right. It may or may it may buy more or less in the future, but it's always going to be a hundred dollar bill. If I have an ounce of gold, it's always going to be an ounce of gold. So they don't have any yield because they don't have any risk. But the risk is uh, when you put your money in the bank, you put your money in, in a so-called money market fund. And I, you run into people who go, I've got money in stocks, I've got money in bonds, I've got money in real estate. I say, no, you don't. You have stocks, bonds, and real estate, but that's not money. If you want money, you have to sell the mm -hmm. stocks, bonds, and real estate to get the money out of the system. And when you do that, guess what? Everyone's doing it at the same time. The price is collapsing. Your wealth is disappearing in front of your eyes. Once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki of the Rich Chat Radio Show. Our guest in studio today, which I'm very honored, humbled, is James Records. He's a global chief strategist. He's really a futurist. That's what I call him. And his last latest book is The Road to Ruin, The Global Elite Secret Plan for the Next Financial Crisis. We still haven't got into that one yet, <laughs> but we're explaining what the logic is for calling gold, and we're not saying it's going to happen, so don't, don't invest on this. $10,000 an ounce gold, when today it's around $1,300 plus the royalties up to $1,400 for a 
U.S. Uh, Eagle. But anyway, it's the logic. It's why is he calling for 10,000 an ounce gold? And if you knew it was going to go to 10,000, what would you do? If the bank's going to give you 1.2% in a money market certificate, which would be a tragedy, would you still keep it in the bank? And there's a reason to keep it in the bank, because it's not an answer thing, because we're probably going into a liquidity trap right now anyway. So all of these things are covered in his book, The Road to Ruin. And Kim has seen me, I've read the book, I studied the book, but she's seen me walk around the house with my, my Bluetooth headphones on, listening to The Road to Ruin. And it, it takes me about a week to get through all those chapters. But, but I gotta say, as a result of The Road to Ruin, Jim, we've, we, as a, I, and as I was listening to some of your interviews this morning before the show, I said to Robert, I said, I'll guarantee you after this interview with Jim that we're going to make some changes and we're going to end up buying more gold and we're going to be do it, changing things with the banks and we're going to be doing all this stuff again, which okay. is fantastic. I mean, and she came she came out of the room flying. Her hair was on fire. <laughs> so I, I was watching Jim. That was this morning. But well, anyway, the big thing was I was moving because we have our problem is too much cash and we yeah. don't know where to move it to. Right. So we go to each bank and we, we take it up to $250,000 FDIC. Hopefully they'll still be there, counterparty right. risk. But it's really a problem. Do you know what I mean? It's really a problem to have cash. So, but, but this is the point. And every time we got there, the bank always said the same thing, which was put it into. Wouldn't you rather put it into a money market where you get more interest? Right. <laughs> we kind of laughed at the more interest thing anyway, because you're talking about zero point. But what is wrong with one. a money market? Well, money market is one, money market funds. It's one of the great misnomers in history because it's not money. You know, they're selling you a money market fund, but it's not money. It's a fund. So you're getting a share or a unit in a fund managed by a third party. Um, not FDIC insured. And then you have to ask That's yourself. That's the catch, isn't it? Correct. It's not FDIC insured. It's not a bank product. They, they might sell it to you in the lobby of the bank through their brokerage arm, but it's not a bank product. Then you have to say, okay, who's behind that money, the so-called money Who's a counterparty. Fund? Correct. What are, they, what are they, I'm giving them my money. What are they doing with the money in Correct. the money market funds? So we come back. Again, the question is, if you could, the, you know, the song is, I can see clearly now, if you could see that gold was going to go to 10,000 and today it's around 1,400, 1,300 and not in ETFs, stay out of those things like GLD and SLVs. But we're going to be talking about what is the logic behind it. And when we come back, we'll be with James Records again and we'll be talking more about what's really going on in the global economy. You're listening to The Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. Don't be like Charlie. Charlie is that do-it-yourselfer who does himself in. Do-it-yourself is good for tile and grout. It is not good for asset protection. Charlie thought he'd save a few dollars forming his LLC online. With no guidance, he did it wrong. When he sold the property, he lost thousands and thousands of dollars. He did himself in by trying to do it himself. Don't burn yourself. Use Corporate Direct to set up and maintain your LLCs and corporations. Corporate Direct is owned and operated by attorney and rich dad advisor, Garrett Sutton. Garrett wrote the bestsellers, Loopholes of Real Estate and Start Your Own Corporation. He is Robert Kiyosaki's attorney for asset protection. He and his team will do it right. Visit them at CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Rich Dad and receive $100 off your formation fee. That's CorporateDirect.com. CorporateDirect.com. Financial freedom begins with financial education. Now back to Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad Radio Show. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about the future. Very honored today to have James Rickards in our studio today because we've been teasing you about if you knew that gold was going to go to $10,000 an ounce, and today as we're speaking, it's around $1,300, $1,400 with the premium on it. What would you do? Would you keep the money in the bank or would you go run and buy some gold now? And we're not saying to do that. But it's about being clear on what's coming in the future. So once again, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on Android or iTunes. And all of our programs are, are, are archived at richdadradio.com because repetition is how we learn best. So if you listen to this program once, then go to richdadradio.com, dial it in, listen to it. Listen to it with your friends, family, and business partner and discuss it because it'll make more sense the more you repeat it. And Kim knows as I've been walking around our house listening to James Records on my, because I've read the book, the road, I've read all his books, but the road to ruin was the most shocking because it was the clearest because I could see the future from there. 
And, uh, and it, it took me a while to grasp it because it's not just one thing. It's, the price of gold is just a reflection of what's happening underneath all of that. So Kim and I are just honored to have James Rickards in our, in our studio today. And once again, his website is jamesrickardsproject.com and maraglim.com. And also you have a newsletter, don't you have? Uh, yes, I have a couple. Uh, a strategic Intelligence is the main newsletter. Okay, thank I'm you. Gore, yeah. Any comments, Kim? Well, we're talking about gold going to 10,000. So you actually do have the math of behind that. Exactly, Kim. And as I said earlier, I, I don't like to debate claims. I like to do the analysis. So this is actually very simple. You can do this at home. It's like seventh grade math. There's no calculus involved. But here are the facts. If you take the major economies, so US, uh, Europe, Japan, and China, how much money do they have? Well, their money supply is about $24 trillion. That's how much money is in the world from those major economies. How much gold do you need to support to restore confidence that, was, that we were talking about? It's debatable, but I say 40%. Throughout the 20th century, the U.S. backed the money supply with 40% gold or more. So let's just take 40%. Oh, it's 40%, not 20 uh, so. Correct. It was 20% in the um, 19th century uh, gold standard oh, okay. of the British, but 40% in the United States. That okay. was by law until 1965, right. by the way. Lyndon Johnson changed it. So let's just take 40% because there's good historical precedent for that. So 40% of $24 trillion is $9.6 trillion. So you need $9.6 trillion worth of gold to back up the money supply with a 40% backing. How much gold is there? Official gold, 33,000 tons. So just take uh, 33,000 tons divided by $9.6 trillion, and you get $9,000 an ounce, but the, they keep expanding the money supply. So just, <laughs> you know, you know when, you, uh, when you go hunting, you don't aim at the target, you, you lead the target. So $10,000, that's the price the gold would have to be to support the money supply without deflation. It's that simple. Okay, good. And one Thank more you. thing is you're very concerned about China stockpiling gold? I am, and uh, China and Russia both have tripled their gold reserves in the last 10 years. And when we did the financial war game for the Pentagon in 2009 uh, with a partner, this is the scenario we played out. Now, we got laughed at, we got ridiculed. There were people, what are you, why are you putting gold in this war game? Don't you know gold's not money? But we warned the Pentagon that Russia and China were in the red zone, going for the end zone by stockpiling gold so that they could do a gold-backed money scenario. It has played out exactly the way we predicted. As I say, they both tripled their gold reserves. By the way, but from 2014 to 2016, when the price of oil was collapsing and Russia lost $200 billion of reserves, they never sold an ounce of gold. In fact, they kept buying. They sold dollars, they sold euros, they sold everything else. But they kept buying gold even when the reserves were drawing down. Now the reserves are going up again, and they're still buying gold. So uh, let's go to the one more subject that's important is, you know, I call you a futurist. Now there's a different ways of predicting the future. And academics look at the future driving into the future with their hands on the rearview mirror. That's my analysis. Right. And you know, people also say every military general fights the last war, but they don't see the new war coming. Right. And one of the things I loved about the road to ruin, you talked about the difference between the bond market and the stock market, and there was a massive flash crash on October 15, 2014. Mm -hmm. And the average person, does, what does that mean? What does the bond market crash mean? And that's is where Bayesian forecasting, so there's, there's academic forecasting and Bayesian. So as a Bayesian forecaster, when you see this flash crash in Oct October 15, 2014, how does your logic system kick in versus versus an academic like uh, Janet Yellen or Bernanke? And, sure. and what is Bayesian? Exactly. You, you make a very good, good point, Robert. So if you're going to do forecasting, you need some methodology or some model. It's not a crystal ball. It doesn't work. You can't guess. Uh, that's actually dangerous. Uh, you need a rigorous model. And most people, uh, most academics, and Janet Yellen very famously, use uh, statistical methods that, are, that involve lots and lots of data, more data, more data, more data. And if they don't have enough data, they don't forecast. They say, we don't, we don't have enough to do this. And that's what I mean. They're, they're driving into the future looking in the rear view Correct. Mirror. So they're looking at the past saying, get me piles and piles of data. I'll do what they call regression, you know, comparisons of one thing to another. What's the relationship? And then that's the basis for my forecast. 
first of all, that's a junk because quite often we're surprised that things happen in the future that are very different than what happened in the past. That's complexity especially theory. Especially now. Correct. That, that Especially now. That's part of what we do with, uh, with our- I don't think Janet saw 9-11, did she? No, she didn't, and uh, neither <laughs> neither did the White House. But more importantly, Janet didn't see 2007, didn't yeah, see 2008, didn't see real estate. and neither did Ben Bernanke. Yep. Bernanke's mm-hmm. walking around in the minutes of the Fed uh, in the spring of 2007, which was pretty late in the game, saying, oh, this housing crisis will blow over, it'll be yep, contained. Right. They had no clue, none at all. So let's talk about Bayesian forecasting, which I learned in the intelligence community, Robert. I think you, I learned, the military. you learned in the military. This is what you do when you don't have enough data, but you have life or death problems. In other words, just because you don't have enough data, you can't throw up your hands. If people's lives are at stake, which is what the military and the intelligence community confront, you have to do something. Now, Bayes, um, there was a real person, Thomas Bayes. He was an 18th century uh, minister in England, but he was a pretty good mathematician. He invented this formula. The formula is over 200 years old. There's nothing new about it, but it has never been used in finance. It's been used in the military and intelligence, which is what we talked about, Robert, and where I learned it. It's been used in a lot of applications. So how does it work? Basically, you say, look, okay, I don't have enough data. I always say, look, if you have enough data, a smart high school kid can solve the problem. How do you solve the problems when there's not enough data? That's much more of a challenge. So what you do is you make an, an, an estimate or a guess, the best you can. You know it's a guess. You have to be very humble about that. But you say, based on what I know, based on some history and a little bit of data, here's what I think is going to happen. But then here's the hard part. You test it rigorously with subsequent events. And this is what the Janet Yellens of the world hate. They say, wait a second. You're forming a hypothesis with not enough information, and then you're going to like test it on future things. Too bad. That's the way it works. This is how you find missing aircraft, missing submarines. So I faced this problem at the CIA. We were doing counterterrorism, and it was after 9-11, and we were trying to predict the next attack, uh, the next spectacular attack. And uh, Janet Yellen said, well, we would have said, you know, hypothetically, well, let's wait for 10 more attacks, and then we'll have 10 data points, and then we can do the regressions and all that. <laughs> well, that's good well, yeah, So 30,000 dead Americans while you're trying to do your statistics. We had one data point. But we had to sort of, so we formed hypotheses. But then as new facts come in, here's, here's the key thing. You ask yourself a question. What is the probability or the likelihood that the subsequent thing would be happening if my original hypothesis were true or false? You test the validity of the first guess based on su- the correlation with subsequent things. And if they validate it, then you raise the probability. You go from 50 to 60 to 70 to 80. If they invalidate it, you lower the probability. And at some point, you abandon it. So you abandon the bad guesses. Uh, just put them to one side. Try again. The good guesses get stronger, and that's the basis for your forecast. And I stood in the London Eye on June 20th, 2016, in London, three days before Brexit, and I said, they are going to vote to leave. And that was completely out of consensus. Nobody saw that coming. On uh, In the days leading up to the election, on November 6th, 7th, uh, 2016, I was in television studios live around the world. I said, Donald Trump is going to win this election. I got laughed at. I got ridiculed. But those were completely out of consensus. But they were not guesses. I was using this technique that I just described. It's the same technique I use to forecast $10,000 gold. It's called Bayesian statistics. Very powerful stuff. And So you're... So you're predicting Ice-9. What is Ice-9? Ice-9 is a phrase that I borrowed from the great novelist Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, He wrote a novel called Cat's Cradle, which I highly recommend. This is in the early 60s, around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So in a nutshell, there's a scientist who invents a, a molecule, and it's just like water except for two things. It has a much higher uh, melting point, so it's frozen at room temperature. And if it comes in contact with regular H2O, it turns the H2O to ice nine. So he, he put it in vials, gave it to his kids, and the plot is if you open the vial and poured it into a stream, the stream would turn to ice, the bay would turn to ice, the ocean would turn to ice, the entire planet would freeze, and life on Earth would die. It was a doomsday machine based on this one molecule. But I use it to, uh, to as a metaphor for how contagion spreads, how financial contagion spreads. It starts in money markets, then it goes to the stock market, then it goes to the bond market, then it goes to real estate, and it takes everything down with it. Now, in the last crisis in 2008, what was the response to that? We started going down that road. Mm-hmm. Those contagion markets were crashing. The response was print money, Get, you know, ben Bernard get, guaranteed every bank deposit in America, guaranteed every money market fund in America, did $10 trillion of swaps with the European central banks, to, uh, central bank to bail out Europe, et cetera. They just printed money, spread the guarantees around, and, and they, we got through it, got through it. 
in the next crisis, here's the problem. They're not going to be able to do that again because they've never normalized their balance sheets. The Fed took its balance sheet to $4 trillion. If they got back to $1 trillion, I say, okay, you could do it again. But they didn't. They're still at $4 trillion. They can't do it again. So what are they going to do when this panic breaks out? Wait, why can't they do it again? Because, because back to what we were talking about earlier, Robert, the confidence boundary. In other words, oh, $4 trillion? Oh, what are you going to do? Go to $8 trillion? $12 trillion, $16 trillion. At what point do people lose confidence? At what point do people say, I-, I don't know what you guys are doing. I'm out of here. Get me out of dollars. Get me into everything else. So the Fed, by the way, the Fed is trying to reduce their balance sheet right now. They're actually destroying money, but they're doing it very slowly, not in time for the next panic. So, But the Fed understands that there's a limit. It, we don't know exactly what it is. I can't tell you if it's $4.6 trillion or $5 trillion, but it's there somewhere. You're going to break the confidence in the dollar. So they can't go there. So what will you, th- what do you print, think? Print that much more money. Correct. So, so what, do, what do you see? You're assuming people coming. are that intelligent. Though, you know? Well, there, there's, you know, when I say- Early guys are that intelligent. I, I like to say, Robert, when it comes to your own money, everybody has a PhD. <laughs> people, are, people are pretty smart. They, they might do this intuitively. Uh, they might not, not have uh, PhDs in economics, but people get it. They know that something's wrong. If they see the Fed doing that, it'll be, you know, on the blogs and the websites and Twitter and the nightly news and the, the people will get it and they will back away from the dollar. And the Fed knows that. Why would the Fed be reducing its balance sheet today if they didn't think there was a confidence boundary, if they didn't think they had pushed it too far? So then, okay, so now you have the panic, you have the contagion, spreading like wildfire. You can't print your way out of it, or at least not quickly. So what do you do? You lock down the system. That's ICE-9. It'll start. But that's what happened in what you saw in Crete or Cyprus. It, Cyprus. it happened in Cyprus. It happened in Greece. They shut down uh, all the banks. Correct. And, there were, and actually, but it happened. you're right about Cyprus, Robert, but, but it also happened in Greece. There were, there were Greeks in Athens. They were flying to uh, Frankfurt, getting suitcases full of euros, flying back because the ATMs were shut. The banks were shut. They wouldn't take credit cards. If you were a foreign tourist at the airport, okay, maybe your credit card worked, but the Greek, uh, the, their, those people, their credit cards did not work. People couldn't pay for anything. They were reverting to barter, and as I say, they were smuggling in like paper euros, banknotes, to Greece so they could just buy food for their families. So that's what Einstein looks like, and people say, well, it can't happen here. Well, of course it could. In 1933, by executive order, Franklin Roosevelt closed every bank in America. Closed. And he didn't say when he was going to reopen them. Now, they they happened to reopen about eight days, but he didn't say that at the time. He said, we'll get back to you, American people, and then they came up with a plan. Uh, but today, you wouldn't even need the executive order. Just throw a switch and shut down the ATMs. So that's why you don't recommend people holding gold, anything in the banks today because they can shut down the banks. Correct. Uh, now, some look, if you have a lot of cash, you can't yeah. pile it under mattress and the bank won't let you anyway. Try try getting a lot of cash out of the bank. They'll, no, they don't have they'll, it. They'll, well, it, first of all, you might have to come back at, by appointment. Uh, they'll file a currency transaction report, put you in a file on the Financial Crimes Enforcement Net- Network right next to Osama bin Laden, yeah. uh, you know, et cetera. So you can do it, but it's extremely awkward and Lots of reports, lots of paperwork, et cetera. So that, that's why you're saying open accounts of 250000 or less per bank? Right. Uh, so have some cash just for yeah. like you'd have battery right. and flashlights for a storm. But yeah, 250000 that's the FDIC insurance limit. You get to that limit at one bank, go to a different bank. That's fine. Each one is insured individually. I wouldn't uh, be completely confident in the FDIC itself. Yeah. Where, it out. where are they going to get the exactly. money beyond a certain point? But as a practical matter, you do have to do that. You're right, Kim. But this is where gold comes in because physical gold in a safe place. Uh, not you know, in a bank. Not, not in a bank. You know, don't put it in a, in a bank deposit box because that's the first thing they'll close. Uh, there's, a, there's what's called a conditional correlation. The time you want your gold the most is when the banks are going to be shut. But this is also why you say having cash is good, too, because there could be a, a liquidity crisis. Correct. And uh, if everything you say is coming true, there'll be a shortage of cash, too. That's right. Well, actually, you know, it's happening in India today. I saw a news article uh, uh, just in the past couple of days where the um, everyone is taking their money. Everyone in India is taking their money out of the ATMs. There's a run on cash because they're worried about the solvency of the banking system. Now, bear in mind, it was just two years ago that the Indian government outlawed Cash, yes. phys- physical they, cash. They, they yeah. canceled some money. They canceled. There was you had you had rupees in your wallet or purse, and they said this is no longer money. Bring it down to the bank, turn it in. We'll give you a different kind of money. Of course, the tax inspector is waiting there. It turns out the tax evasion actually wasn't that much of a problem. The, the Indian government thought they were going to flush out all these tax evaders. It turns out people just like cash. You know, you'd pay for your supplies or whatever. Um, so that was a, that was a red herring. But that was a, a searing experience for the Indians. But now. 
Now the new money is issued, and the, they're taking that out of the ATM. So they're starting to shut the ATMs. So Einstein is happening all over the world. I think Americans are naive and overly complacent if they think it can't happen here. It has happened here, 1933. Uh, Hurricane Sandy in, in the East Coast. They, there's no electricity. ATMs don't work without electricity. So have some gold and silver. And, uh, uh, we, could, we could go on and on and on and <laughs> on, you know, because, because being a futurist and all this, it's just – Interesting to see it. Please read his books, Jim's, Jim's Rickard's books, Currency Wars, Death of Money, New Case of Gold, and The Road to Ruin, because the object is not, we're not giving you answers, we're teaching you how to see the future, because James Rickards is the raven, and the raven is the god of, is the symbol for prophecy throughout history. So anyway, I thank you, James, because uh, we're at a very crucial time in history. And thank you for your contribution to us. Final words, Thank Kim? you. I, I just want to say Ask Robert will return next week. Um, so please submit your questions to askrobert at richdadradio.com. I'd rather, I, I'd rather ask Jim, not I ask know. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And we only we, there was so much we can oh, talk God. about. Oh. And I'd love, we'd love to have you back, Jim, because there's just so much going on here. And we barely scratch the surface. Well, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Kim. But, Great to be with you. We'd love to come back. Yeah. Yeah, and now we're going to go out and buy more gold, and we're going to do stuff with our money, and here we go. <laughs> yeah. And then don't buy gold ETFs, which is GLD or SLV for silver, because it's the same problem with paper. Thank you very much, and thank you for listening.